Experts say one reason for the increase in youth violence is an increase in violence in the media. And they claim that in turn has led to a heightened interest in violent toys. A fact that one group of parents is hoping to change. Donna Skelly has more. They are aimed at toddlers to teens and are becoming more and more popular. From action-adventure games to foam target guns, the sale of violent toys is on the rise. It's a fact many parents and child behavior experts link to an increase in violence on TV. People like Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman of the U.S. Army, who teaches psychology at West Point, uh, saying that these video games are uh, uh, socializing an entire generation of young people into thinking that there's nothing wrong with killing. The wrong messages are going up. Uh, what we see people doing, what we hear people saying, and what we're given to play with as children um, affects the kind of person we become and what we do with violence and conflict. Just days before Christmas, this group is calling on retailers to pull violent toys from their shelves. They say they will be visiting a store on Thursday to ensure that the toys have been removed. Santa and, and, and some elves will cheerfully and, and, and peacefully start removing the violent toys from the shelf and placing them in, in bags and tying up the bags uh, so that they are protected from you know, being sold to children and taken to the manager and ask that he deal with them in an appropriate manner. And if store officials call police on Santa and his helpers? Santa may have a rap sheet. Officials at Toys R Us were unavailable for comment, but a spokesman at another major toy retailer, Walmart, said he was unaware of the request and that he would be contacting the group to discuss this matter further. Donna Skelly, on TV News. It's not a video game up there, Lieutenant Buxton. You do realize that, don't you? Yes, sir. For those living on the streets, it's a situation of life and death. On TV's Gene Lee reports. Stephen Townsend has nowhere to turn but the Good Shepherd Center. The former tow truck driver has been living off and on the streets for six years. The toughest part is when it's cold, when it's like raining, snowing. When it's warmer weather, we can tolerate it. But at minus 30 to minus 40 degree weather, living on the streets can be a death sentence. The Good Shepherd Center serves about 600 to 700 meals a day to those who wander the city streets at night. During these cold snaps, extra beds are added to the 86 that are already in place. But adding extra beds is only a one-night stand. John Koskoff says affordable housing with support is the long-term solution to helping the needy who oftentimes can't break that homeless cycle. You know they've, made, they've been making the efforts recently and they've been making an effort on their addiction and they are successful and they end up having an overdose or so forth and it's very sad. Each sad story shows a different face and Townsend's face tells a story of a man who just wants to get back on track. A job, a better place, but for now I have to accept each day at a time. Something Townsend will sleep on and hopefully not dream about life on the street. Well, it's no secret that the problem of shelter for the homeless is an acute one in Toronto, not only during the cold snap, but at almost any time of the year. In fact, it led to a protest in the city earlier today where some of the participants received a rough welcome from the military. Lisa Saunders was covering that story. It may have been minus 40 with the wind chill, but these protesters were hot under the collar. Homeless people are outside today while this building sits empty and warm. Well said, Jay! It's the historic Fort York that this group wants to seize from the federal government. And that means declaring war on the military. If Canada spends in one year on housing what it currently spends on the military, we could wipe out homelessness within a year. While this battle was short-lived, the message continues. It was just one month ago that Fort York Armory was shut down as a temporary shelter for the homeless. The city has since opened three new shelters with a 260-person capacity. But 
These demonstrators say relocation is not a solution and would like to see Fort York Armory reopened as permanent housing. If people had a place to live, then they could be productive citizens. They could be productive and they could do something valuable. But this protest was not regarded favorably by the federal government. Homelessness Minister Eleanor Kaplan would not comment on the issue when contacted by phone. Her office pointed out that $268 million has been pledged towards affordable housing. But this group is prepared to wait in the cold until the government changes its mind. We're going to wait it out, yeah. We're dressed for winter. We're ready to put ourselves on the line. Lisa Saunders, on TV News, Toronto. Well, most of the homeless in this province are out of work as well, despite the claims of Premier Mike Harris, who says his tax revolution has fueled a booming economy. Harris is now calling on the federal government of Jean Chrétien to cut the income taxes by 20% to fuel the creation of more than 2 million new jobs. So there is no word yet on any charges. And members of a protest group on trial for causing mischief at last year's Hamilton Air Show were acquitted this morning. The judge ruled the 14 members of the Father's Day Coalition for Peace did not commit any crime when they blocked an entrance to the air show. The group was demonstrating against what they say is a glorification of war. CH's Norman James has more. Not guilty, and to the accused, it's no surprise. He had thought it out. Looking at the videos, looking at all of the evidence. After four days of testimony, the judge ruled there wasn't enough evidence to prove the protesters committed a criminal act. He also felt they followed through on their promise to remain peaceful. All 14 charges of mischief were thrown out. It was a very easy decision for him because he didn't have to go past the facts. Uh, the Crown didn't even come close to proving beyond a reasonable doubt that there was uh, a mischievous act uh, that was committed. Charges were brought against coalition members last summer when they blocked the gates of the Hamilton International Air Show. Several were arrested and spent the night in jail. The group feels Hamilton's air show and others like it promote war by displaying military planes. I hate to think that taxpayers' money was wasted on a four-day trial. That's the sad part. With this legal victory behind them, the group and their message march on. Again in July, they will be back at the air show. But this time, they hope to create dialogue and not a fuss. What I've suggested is that we have a circle arrangement where members of the Canadian Forces are invited, uh, members of uh, the peace community are invited, veterans, victims of war, everyone. We're willing to talk to the war show and work with them about what kind of dialogue and what format it takes. The next stop for the coalition is Hamilton City Hall on May 15th. Their council will decide on a $100,000 grant for the air show. Members of the coalition say they will be on hand to voice their opposition. Norman James, CH News, Hamilton. A blow for Hamilton International Airport. Its only direct connection with the United States will end in July. That's when U.S. Air Express will make its final departure, ending service between Hamilton and Pittsburgh. The airline says its flights were only about a quarter full. WestJet Airlines can... ...every year on Father's Day weekend. Fourteen members of that coalition were in a Hamilton courtroom today, and they were acquitted on charges of mischief stemming from a protest at the air show last year. The group claims the show glorifies war and contributes to the militarization of children. CH's Norman James will have that full story tonight on CH News at 6. University President May. They say Peter George spent more time talking about losing his socks in his new house at a recent Board of Governors meeting than he did spend talking about the ongoing strike by Mac support staff. CH's Jennifer Reed has the details. Students showed up by the dozens to donate their old smelly socks to McMaster's president. There you go, Peter George. At the McMaster Board of Governors meeting last week, George mentioned that he couldn't find any socks to wear. So the students are pitching in. Peter George has lost his socks and doesn't know where to find them. They call themselves the sock block. We're a little concerned about the fact that he took the time to talk about that and not talk about the strike. We would like him to show more concern for his staff. And if all it takes are a few pairs of socks to get George to focus on the strike, then some students say he can have theirs. I'm willing to give up my socks if it means that uh, someone's going to pay attention to the cause. I've definitely signed my sock. Um, I, I'm disturbed that Dr. George um, spent time talking about socks and not time talking about MUSA resolution. Late this afternoon, away from the cameras, the university president did meet with the students. He told them he does take the strike by McMaster's support workers very seriously and that he hoped the students do as well. 
For their part, the students say now that they've got his attention, they'll keep the pressure on. We need to channel that kind of frustration the students are feeling uh, and target it at the people that really need to hear it. And quite frankly, it's the administration that's uh, stonewalling the whole process. Students on campus say this is not the last sock drive. They say that until the strike is over, they'll show up at any event Peter George attends with a handful of dirty old socks. Jennifer Reed, CH News at McMaster University.